Please stay tuned for important disclosure information at the conclusion of this episode. Hi, and welcome to The Long View. I'm Christine Benz, Director of Personal Finance and Retirement Planning for Morningstar. And I'm Jeff Patak, Chief Ratings Officer for Morningstar Research Services. Our guest on the podcast today is personal finance expert Farnoosh Tarabi. Farnoosh is editor-at-large for CNET Money. She has also written several books, including When She Makes More and You're So Money. In addition, Farnoosh hosts the Webby-nominated So Money podcast, where she interviews leading experts and authors about their financial perspectives and answers listeners' questions. For several years, she has hosted the Webby-nominated web series, Financially Fit on Yahoo. She's also served as a money coach on such shows as Remake America on Yahoo, Bank of Mom and Dad on SoapNet, and TLC's Real Simple Real Life. Farnoosh graduated with honors from Penn State University with a degree in finance and international business. She also holds a master's degree from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Farnoosh, welcome to The Long View. Thank you for having me. It's so great to be here. Well, it's great to have you here. We've wanted to have you on this podcast for a long time. So um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about your personal story. Sounds like you're in the process of writing a memoir that will be released next year. As you reflect on your life thus far, can you talk about what have been some of the most pivotal events leading up to and during your career as a personal finance expert? Yes, sure. So the a book next year, it's coming out this time next year. You're the first, one of the first to ask me about it on a podcast. So I'm honored to be on this one to break the news. Um, essentially, it's a memoir-ish book that really also focuses on a very um, big idea that is near and dear to my journey you know, one that I would really like to share with everybody because I think that it's an important lesson. And the lesson is that fear can be your superpower. We are often told that fear is a catalyst for disaster, that we need to run away from our fears, ignore our fears, fear nothing but fear itself. And honestly, in my life, and this gets to your question, uh, fear has been my a companion in, in so much of uh, the, the decisions that I've ultimately made. And unknowingly, you know, I've now looked back on my life and reflected and I find that I have somehow developed, uh, I, I think, like sort of an emotional intelligence with fear. Um, it happened. It's not that I invited it into my life. That's not how fear works. It just shows up and you have to deal with it. And so the book is called A Healthy State of Panic and how to, you know, use your fears to help you make the changes and the decisions that really matter in your life. And for me, um, ever since I was little, I, you know, my parents are immigrants from Iran. We, they moved here in the late 1970s, early eighties. I was born in Worcester, Massachusetts, which, uh, the New York times calls nobody's first choice. It's, a uh, at the, at the time and still is a pretty challenged city, uh, you know, economically there's crime. It's, the second largest city in Massachusetts. It's very diverse, uh, which was a gift for me growing up, seeing all sorts of people, all different backgrounds. But I was raised with a lot of fear. My parents um, were scared of being in a new country. My mother and I were just 20 years apart, and she was a new mom at a very young age, didn't speak the language, was home alone with me many um, hours of the day, didn't drive. And so she says, the best way I knew how to protect you was to make you afraid, afraid of all the things, you know, talking to strangers, eating other people's lunch at school, uh, going to play dates. And she tried to keep me very protected. It was the best way she knew how to parent. Now that as a kid, as you can tell, was not always great and had, you know, I ran into issues and, and there were you know, looking back, maybe funny, but at the time traumatic, but I was very, I had a very intimate relationship with fear as a kid. I was the poster child for fear, but it, I also remember moments where my fear, um, led me to really a place of self-protectionism and really being determined to be independent and really realizing how much, for example, money can be a tool to, 
navigate life even while you're scared. It can afford you a life that you desire slash need um, in all moments, you know, whether it's because you have to get away from a bad situation or you want to provide yourself with more stability or you want to protect yourself. And I also saw growing up a lot of people, women in particular, who didn't have economic security. And they may have been married or they may have been single parents, but at the end of the day, they may not have had their own bank accounts. They weren't investing. They weren't working. And and that scared me straight, truthfully. It scared me to become a woman who recognize the the power and value in having your own money. And so I, I credit fear for really putting me on the right path, looking at my fears, not as a barrier, but okay, what is this fear telling me? I often say your fears tell you what you care about, the things that you value. When you're afraid of something, it's usually because you want to be really mindful and protective of something. So what is that something? And, and lean into that as opposed to just saying, I'm scared. I don't like this. I want to get away from this. Uh, your fears can be very helpful to you if you can learn how to pay attention and look for the signs. It's always telling you to look inward. That's what fear is there for. It's telling you to hold on, check yourself. What's going on? And sometimes some of the fears are, you know, they need to be kicked to the curb, you know, and I'm not talking about phobias. Like this isn't like fear of flying, you know, this is like Mm -hmm. fear of money, fear of loneliness, fear of rejection, fear of failure, these big, these biggies that seem to show up in our lives and more and more as we age in some cases and, and how to, uh, turn it around and say, okay, this fear has shown up again. What is it trying to teach me? And so to your question again, you know, fear has been there for me and with me. When I got laid off in 2009, I used that as an opportunity to use my fears then to guide me to what I really wanted to do, which was to be a financial expert on my own, not tethered to a nine to five job, which I had learned quite surprisingly that, you know, those aren't secure. Uh, told one day I, I showed up to work that, you know, this is your last day. Um, I also saw as a young person in New York City trying to get by how it was a scary place to be without money and and with debt, which I had, (laughs) you know, I had no money and debt. And so the fear drove me to make money, extra money, side hustles, invest the very little that I had to just be able to feel like I was making small steps towards building wealth and also recognizing that I wasn't alone with this fear, that there were millions of other people like me in the same boat. And, you know, using that to see the opportunity in teaching what I had experienced and learned to others. So again, you know, I I think you're sensing the theme, (laughs) but fear has been this constant thread throughout my life that has helped me professionally, personally, and as a financial expert, I feel like every question that I, that I get from listeners and readers, there's usually an underpinning of fear. And so I say, you know, I'm not a fear expert. I'm a money expert, but I do think that my profession has made me just have this constant relationship with fear, not just my own, but the others who come to me with their questions. Um, And so it's just something that I've been seeing and, and relating to on a daily basis. Clearly, you've made fear work for you. It's been galvanizing in its own ways. Maybe to turn this back to a personal finance perspective, especially focusing on somebody that's early in their journey or perhaps is financially insecure, it seems like fear could be somewhat paralyzing when it mm-hmm. comes to things like trusting others to provide good counsel or to have faith in institutions mm-hmm. in, in which they would ultimately be investing in order to compound their wealth over time and become financially secure. So how do you think that they can make fear work for them in situations like those based on the experiences you've had? Mm-hmm. Well, I think there's always degrees of fear. So sometimes we start out and we think, well, I'm afraid to invest because I'm afraid to put my money in a company. And I don't know where it's going to go. And there's a lot of risk. And that is certainly, there. there is some truth to that. But I always say, okay, with their financial fears, especially, it's really helpful and, and not to sound morose, but go to the dark place. Like there's probably a, an even scarier fear that you're not even contemplating, which I find 
can be the fear to catalyze you to make actually the healthier choice. So the fear you're experiencing now, which is, you know, well, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market, or I don't trust the institution, that can be paralyzing because that feels powerless. Like I can't do anything about them, but what can you do that's within your control? And, and so the next step is to figure out, well, what's the bigger fear? from where I stand, the bigger fear is doing nothing. So are you more afraid of rolling the dice a little bit or, or more afraid of perhaps doing nothing, which is guaranteed to leave you with less money um, in the future than you have today, thanks to inflation? That, you know, looking back at the market and how it's performed historically, we can um, be confident that, you know, if you invest long term, yes, there are going to be days where there's a lot of uncertainty. And yes, there are institutions that are going to come and go. But if you follow that pattern of consistent investment for decades, you will, you know, historically do better than someone who just keeps their money, you know, in a bank account. Now, that being said, you might still be scared. So the question is, are you more afraid of day-to-day volatility and some uncertainty that some companies may not, you know, do you a solid or the fact that if you do nothing, you will not be able to retire. You will have to depend on your children, uh, grown adult children. You will have to continue working into the you know unforeseen future. And for me, the latter is far more frightening. And it is that that actually will mobilize me to do something about it and actually you know, break through that initial fear and and use that bigger fear as a catalyst to do what ultimately needs to be done to build wealth, which is to invest. If that makes sense? It does. Makes sense to me. (laughs) So I wanted to ask, you know, as you embarked on your career as a personal finance expert and you began to write about and podcast in this space, who were some of your main influences as you moved into this area and kind of developed your own philosophy? I'm wondering if there were any books or specific Mm -hmm. individuals who were really galvanizing forces for you personally. You know, Christine, I would say that certainly there were the the original gangsters, the OGs of personal finance, (laughs) such as I remember David Bach, uh, who's the author of The Automatic Millionaire and New York Times bestseller, I think nine times, nine books or nine New York Times bestselling titles. He um, wrote a glowing, you know, recommendation for my book on the cover of my very first book. And and David, um, just the other day, we were we were continuing to text as we've become friends. And he is somebody who I idolized, you know, growing up in this world. Um, He's uh, somebody who was further along than I was at the time. And I remember interviewing him actually for my work as I was writing articles and and doing segments for television. David was sort of a go-to expert and never thought that he would one day become, you know, a, a mentor for me or even a friend, but he has become both of those for me. And I really credit him for so much of, you know, instilling confidence in me teaching me a lot about the importance of, you know, personal finance education and how to do it in a way that feels accessible and and feels approachable and easy. Uh, I'll never forget, you know, his pay yourself first equation and, you know, the idea of like one extra payment on your mortgage a year and how that can, you know, help you basically get out of debt so much faster and build wealth so much faster. And I just thought, you know, he was, um, for me and early on a huge help. And I also was editor, an assistant editor to Jean Chatsky, who is also, I think, um, I, I put her in the same sort of category of the original personal finance experts of, of my time, at least. This is before Facebook and before Instagram and TikTok. <laughs> we just had books and magazines and uh, the occasional, you know, television spot. And she, I, t- I learned so much under her wing. Um, I was 20 something, I think 21 years old. And with Jean, I learned how to be an entrepreneur in the personal finance field. Jean wore many hats. She was an editor, but she was also a speaker, a book author, a TV expert. She worked with brands and she knew how to go direct to her audience as opposed to also, you know, working through the platforms to speak to an audience. And I thought that was an original way to go about journalism and and thought leadership. 
And so I feel very grateful that I had these teachers early on in my career. To be honest, though, as someone who was venturing out in personal finance journalism, as a woman, as a young person, there weren't that many people to say, okay, I want to be like them. You had to sort of find your own path. And I think that that's true still. But today we have the proliferation of financial advice is is powerful. I mean, and it's not just, you know, certain people doing it. It's everybody. I feel like, you know, everybody who has a personal story to share, it's valid. They share it and they get followers. Um, and the diversity of voices today is not like it was when I was starting out. I was considered sort of an outlier back then as a woman. And now, um, well, I do think that there's plenty of more room for women advice givers. It was definitely like, um, a different thing back then, especially to be young and talking about money. Whereas now I think TikTok has totally revolutionized the way that financial advice is given and who's giving it. And before I ask the next question, I will mention that we did interview Gene Chatsky for this podcast. I think it was uh, December of 2020. So people can check that out. You mentioned TikTok. It sounds like you're, you're upbeat on it. I think that one of the practical challenges is mm -hmm. maybe one of curation, sort of figuring out yeah. sort of what is really worth following there, um, right. especially if maybe you have a particular sort of personal finance interest or sort of challenge you're trying to surmount. How have you gone about that sort of like quality control? And, and is there something on TikTok that you found, you know, really resonates with you? Well, to be transparent, maybe I've spent a cumulative like five hours on TikTok in my entire life, uh, five to ten maybe, and I'm increasing that of right as we speak because I feel like it took me a while to get over the hump. You know, I I don't know about you both, but I'm just so overwhelmed with work that, you know, mm -hmm. just adding another platform to go and try to be consistently helpful on is it's a trade-off, you know? So it's like, I'm going to do that but at what price? At what, what is not going to get as much attention? I can't pay attention to everything. Um, but I, I am increasingly seeing the power in TikTok to not necessarily speak to your audience, but find a new audience. My podcast listeners, I don't know how many of them are on TikTok. And the same goes with YouTube. Like I asked my podcast listeners, hey, if I start a YouTube channel, would you come find me? And they're like, we love you, but probably not. Because we also have only so many hours in the day. And once a consumer sort of dedicates themselves to a platform, that's going to be the majority of that person's um, attention span is going to go to that platform. So there's people who are like, Facebook lovers and then there's YouTube fans and Instagram and they're not, someone's not on all of the platforms all of the time consuming. And so I think TikTok is an opportunity, I think, for all creators and advice givers to maybe find a new audience or an audience for the first time. And I think you're right. There's a lot of charlatans on TikTok as there are on all of the platforms. Uh, but TikTok is, is definitely the fastest growing right now and where we need to be most vigilant in terms of uh, figuring out who's giving me the right advice that isn't necessarily tied to trying to sell me something and everybody else. And I, I think that it's like any other kind of sniff test you would want to do, which is to go off platform to search for these people. Like what else have they created? Uh, do they have books? Do they have a blog? Have they been cited in the traditional media as experts? A lot of the folks on TikTok, what's exciting about TikTok is that literally anybody can go on there and start creating an audience, which is exciting, but also as a, as a viewer, you do have to be careful. And I think that the smart approach to TikTok as a consumer of advice is to not take anything too seriously, do a little bit of research off platform of that person. If you really like the advice someone's giving, um, do some research on them. Do they have a Wikipedia page? Have they written anything? And pretty quickly, you can also tell if they're trying to sell you something, um, whether it's like a crypto something or an insurance product. There's a lot of bad advice on TikTok too, but there's also a lot of bad advice on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook. I don't want to, you know, target TikTok and say, this is the only place where you're going to get fed a lot of misinformation. The misinformation is everywhere. So you just have to be very 
you have to do a gut check and you have to, uh, you know, just maybe go down a little bit of a rabbit hole to search for these folks and, and what else they may be hiding, um, that they're not presenting on TikTok. And I have, yes, yeah, started to explore a strategy on TikTok. I do think that it can be a great tool for creators and people like me who want to continue building an audience. And I know I have a book coming out in a year, so it's important to, you know, believe it or not now, start to slowly build the audience around that thesis of your book so that when it comes out, it's not coming out of left field. They're like, oh yeah, I get that. Especially this book is about fear. And if I'm a financial expert, you might not make the connection. So I have to be very strategic about that. So I'm thinking maybe TikTok could be a place to start experimenting with some videos that are educational, that work in this concept of fear and debunking these fear myths. But you know, like any platform, I'm learning there are approaches that work best, techniques, people speak fast. These videos can't be longer than three minutes, preferably shorter. They love the show and tells. They love when you go behind the scenes and you have to see what's trending because there's definitely like trends, you know, weekly trends. So if there's certain videos that people are loving because um, of the way that they're being filmed or the filter that they're using or the music that they're using, I mean, leveraging that is also a smart way to go about it as a developer or creator. It's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. It yeah. sounds like it. Um, I wanted to pivot to get your financial advice for individuals. And I want to look specifically at this current time frame that we're living through. The pandemic we saw brought about meaningful improvements in personal savings rates, but those have reversed course over the past year as I think spending opportunities have opened up and we've seen inflation. So are there any hacks that people can employ to help keep their savings on track kind of regardless of economic environment? I mean, I think that the best advice, the number one tip is nothing new. And, and it's something that I have been utilizing myself since the very beginning. And it goes back to prioritizing your savings as opposed to looking at savings as sort of the thing you do at the end of the month, if there's anything left over, paying yourself first, as soon as you get paid, you know, whatever you can do, 5%, 10%, automatically to a checking account or a savings account. There are also apps that weren't around when I was starting out that I think this generation, the current generation, really has a benefit from. And, and things like, um, I believe it's called Digit, for example, which is a smart app. It will hook up to your checking account and, and see how your cash flow is working. You know, they'll, it'll start to monitor your cash inflow, cash outflow. And every once in a while, it will text you, hey, Christine, hey, do you want to save $5 today? And who can't save $5? Sure, let's do it. And little by little, these incremental saving opportunities, it finds you by the end of the month, maybe you've saved $200. And the app has saved users, you know, I think $5 billion or something over the course of its life, which is not even, you know, 10 years. So, I think doing it automatically, making the decision once that you want to save and that you want to prioritize your savings and then committing to that and then going back to your life. We know like behaviorally, it's the best way as, you know, as human beings, we don't like to save. It's not something that we um, prefer to do. We prefer to spend because it's more gratifying in, in the moment to spend. We get more enjoyment out of spending than saving. So to make it as effortless and painless as possible, you automate it. And certainly you can adjust this as you have fluctuations in pay. There might be months where you're making less or more. So being on top of that and adjusting that savings rate to better accommodate where you are in your life is, is really key. I think also one thing that is important to remember, particularly in times when you may be experiencing, you know, we have inflation and we also have wages not keeping up with inflation, um, that being your own advocate, your financial advocate is really important, speaking up, whether that's at work or with your billers. And if you need financial help, ask for financial help. It's not going to just show up at your doorstep. And I'll give, you know, examples. So like at work, um, it may mean that you talk to your employer about, 
increasing your pay, asking for a raise. That's not a short-term win. That's not like an overnight win, but something to start having those conversations or looking for a job that will pay you more. I mean, one of the bright spots in the economy right now is still the employment market. Um, I don't know how long it's going to last, but if you are not happy with your benefits and how much money you're making and you have not been able to have a successful conversation with your boss about that, start looking around. And I think, again, I don't know how long it's going to last, but I think the power is still tilting in the worker's favor. We're seeing uh, more people unionizing, for example, more workforces unionizing. But then I would say on the consumer front, if you have loans, if you have bills, talking to your billers, these monthly recurring payments, whether it's, you know, your credit card, your, for example, loan payments, talking to your lenders about uh, reducing your interest rate or creating more amenable terms so that you can make those monthly payments. A lot of times consumers don't even know that they can adjust their billing dates. So if all of your bills are coming due on the 15th of the month, that's hard. No matter who you are, all of your money going out on one single day, especially if you're a freelancer or a contractor and you're getting paid not consistently, that can be very, very hard. So you can sometimes just go on the website and change the due date for the bill. It still has to get paid within the month, but it doesn't have to always be on the 15th. It could be on the 20th or 20th. 25th. So you, there's certain things that you can adjust to give more wiggle room in your budget. I still also think that, you know, shopping around for a discount is always something you can do. And right now there are so many sales, not just because it's, we're filming this around Labor Day, but because retailers are struggling and department stores especially have a lot of excess. So it does pay to research and shop around and comparison shop and and use as many tools as available to you to get those discounts, whether it's an app or, you know, a lot of times we have those desktop widgets. Like at CNET, we have CNET Shopping. I'm the editor at large at CNET Money. We have this app, or rather it's a, a desktop widget. You can add it to your your browser. And whenever you're shopping, it will tell you whether you're getting the best deal on that site or where else you can get the better deal. Um, I think that the the common theme here is maybe leaning into technology, um, whether it's an app or it's um, an automation that you can take advantage of to to create to build more flexibility and accessibility in your financial life is always usually a good thing. I think those all seem like prudent recommendations, really good hacks. I wanted to widen out a bit and talk about something that might be called mindful spending. You've been at the forefront of that movement, kind of this idea of helping people align their spending with what matters to them. What exercises should people undertake, generally speaking, to help Mm -hmm. align their budgets with what matters in the here and now and what they might like to achieve in the future? How can they ensure that their spending really aligns with those things that they would like to achieve in the future? It seems such a simple exercise. Like, of course, I want to only spend on the things that I care about. And we think we're we're doing just that. But I think the truth is, especially for young people that are coming out of the gate, whether that's, you know, out of college or their parents' house, and they quickly jump into a job and they quickly start to accumulate bills. And then they realize like six months in, two years in, like I have nothing to show for it. And what they really are saying is that I feel like I'm not building towards anything that's meaningful to me. Like I'm just going through the motions of financial adulting. I'm paying my bills. If I'm able to do that, I'm grateful. But above and beyond, I don't feel like I'm building wealth or I am able to take them, you know, have an experience or build the things that are important to me into my day-to-day life. Like I, I used to, you know, go on vacations or I used to paint or I used to, uh, you know, do all these things that I don't do anymore and what's going on. And I think that what was missing was really a, a moment where they didn't stop and go, okay, I have this opportunity. I have a job now. I'm making money. I have for the first time in my life, maybe this opportunity to design my life in a way that really speaks to me. And so the questions that you really need to ask yourself before you start spending is, where do I want to be this time next year? What are my goals? What's 
actually important to me. If I can think about when I was younger and the things that brought joy to my life or made me happy, what were those things? And are there ways that I can reincorporate them into my life? Sometimes they don't cost anything. Sometimes they do, but really mapping it out and creating this sort of, you know, I don't want to call it like your bucket list, but just really like what would make you feel fulfilled in your life? And what are some of the goals that you want to achieve short, medium, and long-term so that you can really put your money to work with those priorities in mind? And long-term, maybe that's, you know, I want to make sure I have enough for myself in retirement. So that means you contribute to the 401k. Medium term, maybe you want to buy a house, but that's not for another 10 years. So maybe you could put a little bit of money in a brokerage account or in an investment portfolio um, and take a little bit of more risk with that medium term savings. Um, And then short term, maybe it is that you want to build in some vacations or you want to invest in another degree or a skill set that you want to learn? What do you want to invite into your life that would help you feel like, help you feel not just successful on paper, but really successful inside that you feel like you're really, you're doing you. And that's the exercise. Like, what does it mean to afford doing you? And not what your friends are doing or what your parents told you is important necessarily, or what you're seeing on social media. Again, We think it's so easy, but it's not because life is so distracting and life moves so quickly. It's very hard to make decisions. We also have so many choices that we can feel overwhelmed by the choices. So it's really about reining it in. And this is meant to be mainly a solo exercise. And and of course, if you have a partner invite them into this exercise, but this is not something where you're inviting your, you know, your college friends and your parents and everybody to give it an opinion on. And that's, I think also where we, um, you know, not to our faults, we think it's the right thing to do maybe because we want to assess and we want to weigh all these opinions, but that can create more confusion. So really it's about taking a moment for yourself and figuring out what's important to you, your values, reflecting too on what may not have been working for you over the last few years. Where do you find, what are the pain points? Um, and, and how can you maybe course correct going forward? And what is that going to cost? I always say that, you know, uh, money is meaningless without goals, but goals carry price tags, remember. So it's important to, as you're thinking about what brings you fulfillment and what your goals are, to understand the costs associated with them. But the good news is, is that you're foreseeing this and it's a plan in the future. So what can you do now to engineer those goals coming true? So much of personal finance seems focused on urging people to save for retirement, but I think we all know how hard it is to talk to 25-year-olds about saving for their 65-year-old selves. So I guess, do you think we need a different pitch to young people Mm -hmm. to get them to save for the future, that maybe the conversation should be refocused on financial freedom more Mm -hmm. than retirement, or maybe saving for those sort of shorter and intermediate term goals first and foremost before you try to get them focused on saving for retirement? I think you're onto something there. I, I definitely think that words like retirement and and all that goes with that, like social security and pension. And I think that that s- certainly served the, my parents' generation and even my generation, I would say to an extent. But I do think that the the, the rising generation and, and talking more like the younger millennials and Gen Z, they have a different financial love language. They're not super excited about retirement because yes, it is abstract and they are in touch with reality. They know that maybe you're not going to retire at 65 because you graduated in a recession or you, um, you know, have student loan debt and that's going to keep you behind for some time. And that goalpost of retiring at 65 is not necessarily what's in your cards, but that doesn't mean that they don't want to save or should save or invest for their future. So I do think that the better message what really resonates with them and me, frankly, is this idea of affording yourself options in the future. Who doesn't want options and who doesn't want to 
have money in the future to afford those options. And I think that there is some merit to refocusing the message and, and maybe using the words that really hit this demographic where it means something. You know, I, I see on social media a lot of times the terms like you know, affording your freedom, financial freedom. Uh, for women, sometimes too, I know what really resonates with them is this concept of having financial agency and power and you know, anything that money for them is a tool to ultimately uh, break through barriers. And, you know, that while there may be some systems and laws that don't work in your favor as a woman, as a person of color, money, while it doesn't solve all the problems and it doesn't get rid of all the isms in the world, it certainly can be a tool for your advancement, your protection, your power, your ability to get out of bad situations. And these are the words, these are, these are the terms that I think really feel more realistic to the current generation. I think um, it would, I mean, if you're a marketer, at like a financial company, I think you need to be paying attention to that because that's how I see a lot of the, we call them, you know, finfluencers, the financial influencers online are connecting to their audience. They're talking about quitting their jobs and retiring, you know, on their own terms. And this idea of fire, right? Financial independence, retire early, which has many meanings to many people I've, I've learned. It's not just like, you know, you have to, uh, have all of the money saved by 40 and then you're sitting on a beach. No, it could just mean that you could even mean that you're working for an employer, but you have so much money in, of your own that you could quit if you wanted to. Uh, you could take two years off if you wanted to. You have suddenly this financial license to do what you want to do that you help to afford for yourself. There's a lot of power to that. And I think that that you're right. That message is resonating. And I think it would benefit anyone who wants to help advance this generation to a place of more financial independence and wealth. It, those are the words to use. I also wanted to ask you about women and money. You wrote a book about when women make more than their spouses. As you point out, it's an increasingly common scenario, but it can also introduce problems in some relationships. Can you outline some of those problems? Mm -hmm. Sure. I'm a breadwinner in my marriage, have been since the start. And I wrote this book because I wanted to help a lot of the women who were coming to me with questions about how to thrive in their relationship when she was making more than him. The reality is, is that more and more women are, are in this role, playing this role, single moms and, and coupled women. Uh, but we don't grow up necessarily expecting this. And society certainly doesn't expect or want this for us. If you look at Pew Research, a majority of men and women say that it is better for the man to be the breadwinner. And, uh, you know, we can spend another hour talking about why that is. But to answer your question, which is what are some of the issues that come up? Um, one is that you know, money is often a topic that couples don't talk about. Wherever they are financially, who is making what the what money, the bottom line is money is usually a, a topic that is very taboo in relationships. But then you add on to this a layer of complexity and nuance, which is she making more than him, which is culturally unexpected and not necessarily supported. Then there's communication breakdown and there's a lot of assumptions that the couples can make about, well, who holds the power now in the relationship? Do we feel like if money equals power, then does one person have more power than the other? Does the wife has more power than the husband? I mean, there's a lot of like unspoken assumptions that may be made because we're maybe coming to the relationship with all these different understandings and expectations about the role of money in the marriage. And there's also the complexity of ego. You know, I, I, I interviewed a lot of men uh, for this book and what they would very honestly tell me is that, you know, they were groomed and raised to feel like as a real contributor in a marriage, as the, as a provider in a marriage, you must, it wasn't just like a nice to have, like it was the need, the man must provide financially. 
it was how he sort of earned his title as a good husband, a good father. And it was an exclusive thing he thought to him, you know, it wasn't something that his wife needed to do or should do. But if that wasn't the role that he found himself in, in the marriage, it could lead to a lot of confusion and loss of ego and wondering what is my role? What is my role as a provider? And again, that can lead to communication breakdown, fights for who knows what reason and struggle. And I mean, I found that when women make more in a relationship, there is a bigger chance for divorce. Money's again, a leading cause for divorce as it is. But then you add this layer of, of challenge and it doesn't take, you know, uh, a scientist to figure out why this is happening. And so there's a lot of emotional challenge sometimes in relationships where she makes more, but, you know, the book goes on to talk about how to sort of level the playing field where um, each person does feel like an important contributor in the relationship, seeing money as really just a tool, a a shared tool in the relationship. Um, The first, I would say the first half of the book is really just addressing some of these emotional challenges that come in these types of relationships. Then a lot of it too is like figuring out your system. You know, how are we going to afford things? And But those issues I don't think are exclusive to relationships where she makes more. It could just be in relationships where there is an income disparity. So the data show that women tend to earn less than men over their lifetimes. They amass less wealth during their lifetimes, and they're also like more likely to be poor in retirement. So some of this seems structural. Uh, women earn less Mm -hmm. than men on average, and they're also much more likely to be caregivers for children, certainly, or their parents. But the data also suggests that women tend to negotiate less aggressively Mm -hmm. for Mm -hmm. salaries than do men. What advice do you have for women on that front, how to improve their financial wherewithal, how to negotiate for themselves for higher pay? Mm -hmm. Just do it. Don't second guess yourself. I I can completely understand why women may not feel empowered to negotiate and ask for more. It's because we have not been invited in this circle for a long time. And I'm talking the financial circle, the career circle. Um, Money and work is... Uh, work where you get paid is is something that is relatively newer to women than men. It's because the laws didn't allow us um, to even have a credit card, you know, without a man co-signing for us up until the 70s. So we're very behind, not because we want to be, but because that's, again, to your point, structurally, systemically, that's how it's been set up for us. And so it's going to take some time for us to feel um, the same level of confidence, perhaps, that men naturally do. But we know this now, right? We know what we're up against and we know the the cost that comes with not asking for more and not investing sooner than later. And so we just have to do it. And I know there are lots of studies out there that say there's a penalty for asking. And my thesis, my theory is that the penalty exists because we're not doing it enough. When you're the only woman in an office of men asking for a raise, yes, you are the outlier. And yes, you may be looked upon more negatively than your male colleagues because it is a factor of numbers. But as soon as more women get hired, so that has to happen. But then when we collectively do this and we do this at, you know, at any cost and we're going to ask for it and we're not going to feel we're going to know maybe there's a penalty, but we're going to do it anyway. But when more of us do it, I feel like we become a force that has to be reckoned with. And we're we're not yet there. We're not this force that has to be reckoned with. Uh, we're sometimes like the one woman in the office that's that's doing it. And then we're trying to encourage the others to step up and, and voice and ask for more. And the more that we can stick together, that we can mentor, that we can be advocates for each other when we're not even in the room. You know, there's mentorship and then there's actual, you know, advocacy for someone that you want to see grow in your office, in your company, who's not even there, um, but you're speaking up on her behalf. I think that men can do this too. Um, and, And so this advice is not just for women, it's also for men. You know, that this is not just something that women need to focus on, that alone women cannot solve for this. We need everybody to recognize that when women are paid 
fairly. And when women make more, everybody wins. Everybody wins. Households win. Companies win. There's more likelihood that she will stay on the job. And by the way, women are excellent employees. I had a, a friend of mine who um, runs an, a newsroom. He said, my favorite person to hire is a, is a mom because she knows how to prioritize her time. She is super productive. And if I pay her right and I keep her happy, she will be with me for the long run. And that is a value add to my team and our company. And you know, not to make this all about the money, but you know, sometimes you have to speak the love language of capitalists. And that is that women uh, will make you money but you have to learn how to pay them right and pay them fairly and provide them not just with money, but with the benefits that they need. And if we know that more men are employers, this is a message to men. So, you know, my advice is ask anyway, ask in numbers, keep your, you know, community of women and mentors, female mentors and male mentors tight. Um, be not just a mentor, but an advocate and message to men. When women make more, the world becomes a better place. This is just as much your gain as it is a woman's gain. We wanted to ask about your podcast. You've, I believe now recorded more than 1400 episodes of your podcast, So Money, which is really remarkable. I think we've done around 180. So 1400, that is quite an achievement. What have been some of the most memorable episodes that you've done? Hmm. Well, I certainly will never forget interviewing Queen Latifah. She uh, somehow agreed to come on my show. <laughs> uh, she is, I mean, the, the podcast barely scratches the surface uh, of all the wisdom that she has to share and provide. But, you know, I, I will never forget the generosity on the show, just telling me some of her failures and her some of her regrets, but also how she has trailed a blaze for women in show business of all types of show business, music and performing and producing and entrepreneurship and all of it. And so she was definitely someone I will not forget. I remember interviewing my parents and that was really, you, you might be surprised, but even, you know, interviewing them in my late thirties at the time, learning a lot about my parents on that particular episode and the things that they were going through as they moved to this country to build a new and better life. And I actually invited my father back uh, later when he was, when he got laid off in his sixties and how he actually invested the next year in teaching himself a new skill to then go back into the workforce and get a job. Uh, my dad is like a careerist and loves to learn and I'm a lot like him, but I was like, would I ever do that? You know, would I, wouldn't I just like call it, throw in the towel in my sixties if I got laid off and just say, well, here, here's early retirement. But he is so passionate about, you know, learning and working and, and applying himself that he did that and, and got an incredible job in um, his mid sixties and still has that job. And so I think sometimes the best interviews are the ones that are a little unexpected like that. But also I, I love interviewing my audience. I sometimes invite audience members on the show. I think that we don't have to reserve the financial advice giving to just those who have, you know, the MBAs and the PhDs and the TED Talks under their belts, that sometimes everyday people have the best advice because they are living it. And and they may not consider themselves experts, but when they come on my show, sometimes we're able to really spotlight the ingenuity and the strategy that they've applied to their financial lives to get themselves out of debt, to save more, invest and retire early if that, whatever the case may be. And I think those are the most inspiring stories because listeners really see themselves in those guests. And I think those are, uh, you know, more than even the celebrities, those are the most successful and most listened to shows, the everyday people. You have a couple of different formats for your podcast. You do a lot of interviews with with people you, which you were just discussing, but you also do kind of a Q and A mailbag style pod right. as well. So I'm wondering, of those two formats, which of those is sort of the easiest and most fun for you? Mm. Definitely the Friday Ask Farnoosh episodes are, I always say, the easiest because the the audience produces that show. They send the questions and then I answer. 
there's not a whole lot of prep. I like to keep it a little uh, off the cuff and certainly some things I'll research. But for the most part, it's like we're sitting down, we're getting a cup of coffee and you're asking me questions and I'm going to give you my honest first takes. And I know that this is the most popular because I can see the numbers. They do a little bit better than the Monday, Wednesday shows, which are more interview and topic focused and topic driven. Whereas the Friday episode is kind of a everything but the kitchen sink, you know, all sorts of questions. And sometimes I bring on experts for those episodes too, because I don't have all the answers, especially when it's, for example, a student loan debt focused Ask Farnoosh, where I sometimes try to time the Friday episodes with what's happening in the world. And currently we have, you know, the, the news about the student loan forgiveness plan. But there are a lot of unanswered questions and I'm not, you know, the expert necessarily on all of that. So I brought on the show recently some experts who were more focused on those developments who could answer a lot of the questions that we had gotten over the week about, will I qualify? What if I've already paid off some of my debt? Um, What if I have private loans? Things like that. So, but yeah, yeah, I think the Friday shows could be their own podcast, certainly. For our last question, we wanted to ask you, What's a personal finance question or issue that you think doesn't get discussed enough? Hmm. Well, I have been trying to discuss more things like the racial wealth gap and just all sorts of wealth gaps, frankly, you know, whether it's like you have a disability and you're having challenges with making money and saving or you're a single mom. And there are certain things that are, you know, you're set up against and the systemic issues that contribute to the fact as to why people are not where they really should be and could be financially. And I think that these conversations come and go, but I would really like for these to be more of a constant and, and really more at the forefront of why so many people struggle with personal finance. Um, We tend to focus on the systemic issues when there's something in the news that reminds us of these issues and these problems, but these these problems exist every day. And I actually, I had a column um, at one point called Closing the Wealth Gap. And it was less about like, here are the solutions, because I don't think that there are any best practices because if there were, there wouldn't be a, a wealth gap. It's all about what are the new ways to think and and do and uh, what are the new products, the new systems that could help to reverse some of these losses for all these different groups of people, but really bringing to the forefront the problems that even exist. So I talked about obviously the racial wealth gap in real estate to the fact that when you get divorced in this country, If you are in a heterosexual relationship, if you're the mom, chances are the court will de facto give you full custody. Well, that may be what you think you want, but did you know that that also leads to the mom having no time and the dad having all the time? And do you know that that does contribute to wealth gaps? Um, And I can go into that, but the, the statistics show that our country has this like mom is best mentality and they don't even consider 50-50 custody. Now, there are exceptions to this. Some parents shouldn't get custody, but the system and also culture has ingrained in us that in a divorce, the children de facto full-time go with mom. And that cripples her ability to uh, be able to afford not just her needs as a mom for her family, but to actually like build wealth and go after the jobs that would help her to advance. And so these sorts of gaps, again, are daily in our lives. And I think that what we learned since the pandemic is that this idea of just working hard and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, that that's what's going to help you achieve wealth is not true. You know, it's maybe true for some people because they arrived in the world with a leg up. But for many people who arrived in the world, um, in a world that wasn't so accepting of them for all sorts of reasons, you know, they they just had a lot of closed doors faced along the way. And that, um, we need to talk about that. And I, I try to talk about it. I have 
you know, things, podcast episodes dedicated to this from time to time, but I'm just one person and I would really love to see more newsrooms cover this and, and dedicate reporters to what I think is, it's a widening wealth gap. Um, at CNET, we're dedicating more coverage to this as well as things like climate change and other things that are happening that we may not think carry a financial toll, but certainly do. And um, I think there's so many intersections that money doesn't have to be this siloed topic. But when you're talking about politics, climate change, relationships, everything has a financial sidebar to it or or a financial integration that we need to talk about uh, because money is everywhere. Money affects us in all the ways. And, you know, it still bothers me when I see some, you know, newsrooms, like if you go on a website for like the New York Times, I'm not, I love the New York Times, but well, actually they they do a good job of it, but there are some, there are some newspapers and, and media platforms that don't just have a money category. They'll call it business or entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. but it's like, no, personal finance deserves its own category. Um, and whether you're a lifestyle or, or a business magazine, like, I just think it's so important and we just need to, you know, lead with it. Well, Farnoosh, this has been such an illuminating conversation. We're really grateful to you for taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much. It's a testament to you that I'm sort of losing my voice now, but I think think that's only because it's been such a good conversation and you've asked really, really good questions. I hope I was able to, uh, to be of service to your audience. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us on The Long View. If you could, please take a minute to subscribe to and rate the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You can follow us on Twitter at S-Youth1, which is S-Y-O-U-T-H and the number one. And at Christine underscore Benz. George Cassidy is our engineer for the podcast, and Carrie Gretchik produces the show notes each week. Finally, we'd love to get your feedback. If you have a comment or a guest idea, please email us at thelongview at morningstar.com. Until next time, thanks for joining us. This recording is for informational purposes only and should not be considered investment advice. Opinions expressed are as of the date of recording. Such opinions are subject to change. The views and opinions of guests on this program are not necessarily those of Morningstar Inc. and its affiliates. Morningstar and its affiliates are not affiliated with this guest or his or her business affiliates unless otherwise stated. Morningstar does not guarantee the accuracy or the completeness of the data presented herein. Jeff Patak is an employee of Morningstar Research Services, LLC. Morningstar Research Services is a subsidiary of Morningstar Inc. and is registered with and governed by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Morningstar Research Services shall not be responsible for any trading decisions, damages, or other losses resulting from or related to the information, data analyses, or opinions, or their use. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. All investments are subject to investment risk, including possible loss of principal. Individuals should seriously consider if an investment is suitable for them by referencing their own financial position, investment objectives, and risk profile before making any investment decisions.